Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And of course today, don't you know, I cannot for the life of me find my little timer thing. So I've got my watch on here and I'm hoping it'll help me stay on track. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. The King James text today reads, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Some of y'all watching online, you're about ready to, to leave. You say, oh, I've heard that preached many times before, and I know exactly where this preacher is going. No, you don't. No, you don't. You don't know Pastor Charles very well. No, you don't. Uh, you need to hang in there. I think you'll find blessing and inspiration in the word that God has given me today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Master, once again, God, we come boldly before the throne of grace. We seek this hour, that divine anointing, that touch from heaven, that sacred oil which flows from the throne of God. We desire, Lord, today that you would touch the messenger, that you would touch the ear of every hearer, that our heart at this moment would be melted and molded, prepared by the Holy Ghost to receive that word which you have given me for the church of the living God at this hour. Oh, Master, help me. Help me, help me to deliver it in a manner that will bring honor and glory to your name. We ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Many today will preach the way of Christ as though it were a difficult way. They will tell you that what Jesus was saying in Matthew 7 was that living the Christian life is about walking on the straight and the narrow. And the straight and narrow path is a difficult path to walk. Well, I'm here to tell you today, these people don't know how to read, nor do they understand when I was in school, we used to have to take tests and we had to learn how to comprehend what we were reading. Do you remember the tests you would sometimes take? The teacher would have you read a story and then they would ask questions about the story. Obviously, as you got older, the questions became a little more complex and a little more difficult. But the idea behind this was to see whether or not you could comprehend. That's why it was called reading comprehension. It was to see whether or not you could comprehend or you could soak in and understand what it is you were reading. Sadly, many in Christian pulpits today, many Christian Today have very poor reading comprehension. They read something and they read into it prejudices that they have carried with them into the reading. You see, there's a lot of things you can see, there's a lot of things you can read. And if you come in and you've already made up your mind 
about this subject or that subject, then as you read new material, you read it with a prejudice. You read it with a slant. Many people have already made up their mind that living for Jesus is not easy. And I'm not saying today it's altogether easy. But it's nowhere near as hard as many try to make you believe. And they will point to Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Oh, but Jesus said, straight is the way, and narrow is the gate that leadeth unto life. Yes, he did say that. He absolutely said that. But he also said, listen, the next verse, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. Listen, and few there be that find it. Mm -hmm. He didn't say the path was difficult to follow. Oh my God, have mercy. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. He didn't say it was hard to stay on the path once you got on the path. What's hard is finding the right path to begin with. He said, and few there be that find it. It's not about the path being difficult to stay on. No, doesn't have nothing. It's a straight path. Honey, there ain't a path in the world that's easier to follow than a straight path. You can't get any easier than walking a straight line. Hello there. Amen. I will tell you, Tommy and I traveled up here to Nashville from North Alabama. All we have to do is get on Highway 65 and for the next 110 miles, it's straight. We don't have to get off on any side road. We don't have to go off on another highway. All we got to do is stay on that one road until we get to our exit. I'm here to tell you today, as a child of God, once you get on the path, it's an easy path to follow. Just keep walking the way you're walking. Just keep doing the way you're doing. You don't have to change anything. You don't The problem is not that most people cannot walk the path because it's a difficult path. No. The problem is most people can never find the path to begin with. Oh my word. We own some property in Oklahoma. I'm going to try to get out there this week and check on it and I haven't been there in almost two years and every once in a while I have to do a safety check and make sure everything's okay. We've got over seven and a half acres in the mountains. Tommy and I, I've done it by myself as well, but Tommy and I one day decided we were going to walk down to the back of the property. I've got our little cabin right up close to the you want to call it a road, it's not much of a road, but if you want to call it a road, our little cabin sits up at the top, and then the property gradually kind of goes downward, and then you can walk down, of course, seven and a half acres is a pretty good hunk of land. And one day, we followed this little path, and we went all the way down to the back of the property, and we were right where the very end of the property, right where the property line ends. And then it was time to go back to the cabin. Well, once you get that far down, you can't even see the cabin. You don't see the cabin. Well, guess what? You get that far down, you don't see the path either. The path you follow down is hard to find to get back up. There's so much stuff overgrowing it. There's so many plants and trees and vines 
that cover it and leaves and pine needles that trying to find the path you follow down is difficult. Now, if you find it, it's not difficult to follow. But just try to find it. Just try to figure out where that starting point is. I'm going to tell you today, most people who call themselves Christians today have no clue what it is to be a Christian. They have no clue what it is to walk the straight and narrow. That's the title of my message today, Walking on the Straight and Narrow. They've never found the path. They never found the beginning because once you get to the beginning, it's straight. It's narrow. It's not hard to follow. You don't have to veer to one side or the other. You don't have to turn aside to the left or to the right. You just got to keep going straight. But most people cannot find the beginning of the path. And the reason for this is most people never will surrender their mind and their heart to the leadership of the Holy Ghost. Because the Spirit of God, the Word of the Lord says, will lead us and guide us into all truth. I have a lot of family that are dying in the wool, fundamentalist evangelical Republicans. They're as hateful and as nasty and as malicious as any human can be. And yet they call themselves Christians. They dishonor the word of God in doing so. They bring shame upon the faith of Jesus Christ by identifying themselves as followers of Christ. They're not followers of Christ. <laughs> no, the Bible said you know by their fruit. Nowhere in the list of the fruits of the Spirit do I read hatefulness, Bitterness, angst, malice, revenge. None of those things are on the tree that is born of the Spirit of God. No. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, meekness, self control. Those are the things that I find in the life of a believer. But most of the Christian world, the evangelical world in America today, doesn't even begin to. <laughs> Honey, if your joy and your peace and your patience and your long suffering go out the window when you go to a political rally, something's wrong with you. Especially when you stand there and tell me, when your faith is supposed to inform your is supposed to inform your politics. Oh, really? Is that why? It, Trump rallies, you hear people chanting and screaming and hollering about tossing people out of this country who have come here from other countries that are fraught with trouble and turmoil and they're looking for a better life and they're looking for a better way of life and they come here and they work themselves to death trying to have something with the rest of us. Oh, but you don't like the color of their skin. You don't like the country they came from. Right now, the nation of choice being picked on by these idiots, and that's what they are as idiots, is Haiti. One senator made a post on Facebook or Ute or uh, X or whatever it is about these Haitians and it was the most vile, racist, nasty 
post I've ever read in my life. And yet that Republican hypocrite will stand there and tell you he's a Christian. Hmm. Got news for you. All you ignoramuses. Not everybody that comes out of Haiti practices voodoo. Right. When I started my first church 40 years ago, my state overseer came to me, Brother Chandler came to me. He said, I want to change your district. I want to put you in a different district. He said, but the pastor, of, uh, the overseer of that district is a black man. Would that be a problem for you? I looked at him and I gave him one of them looks like, what on earth is wrong with you? I said, why on earth would that be a problem for me? What difference does that make to me? And Brother Chandler, who was from Alabama, he was a good man. Don't misunderstand what he said. There was a reason he asked me. It wasn't because that's how he felt, but he wanted to see how I thought, you know, and how I felt. When I told him, I said, Brother, I don't even know why you'd ask me such a stupid question. I said, I could care less what the color of a man's skin is. I could care less, you know, uh, where he comes from. And he said, I'm glad you said that. He said, because that's what I believe too. He said, I just wanted to make sure we were on the same page. And he changed me to Brother Huggins' district. Brother Huggins was... Take a while to guess where he came from. Haiti. And he was a district overseer in the Church of God out of Cleveland, Tennessee. The oldest Pentecostal Christian denomination in America. Okay? So while Trump and his folk are out there shouting and screaming about how all these Haitians are saying, I'm going to tell you something. Some of the most glorious church services I've ever been in in my life, and I've been in a number of them, have been in Haitian American Pentecostal churches. Ooh, those people love the Lord. They serve God with a passion. <laughs> Ooh, I mean, and they worship God with a passion. They are wonderful people. They live godly lives. They work hard. So, my dear Republican ignoramus friend, let me fill you in on a little secret. While you call yourself a Christian and you get behind a loudmouth jackass like Donald Trump, who stands there and rants about how the country that these people came from is nothing but a toilet. And they're bringing all their voodoo and they're bringing all their nastiness into our country. Let me fill you in on a little bit of reality. Most of those people who come are actually Bible-believing Christians. Mm -hmm. That's right. You see, but ignorance is not bliss. No, ignorance, my friend, will destroy a nation. We've got Satan operating through a man named Donald Trump. Some of y'all get nervous because I name names. Well, get nervous all you want to. God called me to a prophetic ministry. He told me to speak whatever he put in my spirit to speak. And I'm going to speak it. And I'm not afraid of their faces. I'm not afraid of the enemy. I'm not afraid of the nasty people. Because God said, I'm there to keep you and to protect you. If you'll speak what I put in your spirit to say then I will protect you. And I'm telling you, I don't get up in this pulpit and say things off the top of my head. I'm speaking what God has put in my spirit to say. We've got a man out there in America today who for the last decade has been sowing nothing but angst and negativity and division. That's all he sows. And his rallies are filled with Thousands of people who call themselves born-again Christians. And brother, they cheer, and they holler, and they yell, and they celebrate as this man speaks nothing but negativity and 
division and strife. Do you know why? Because they are not walking on the straight and narrow. They never found the right path. They can't walk it because they never found it. That is not the right way. If you're going to find the right way, let's go to 1 John 4, 6 through 11. John writes, the apostle whom Jesus loved, writes, We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. You know what that means? When he says us, he's talking about the apostles. Sweetheart, they wrote the New Testament. He says, He that knoweth God heareth us. In other words, if you know God, you're not just going to read the book, you're going to get it. You're going to understand it. You're going to have comprehension. He said, He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the Spirit of truth and the Spirit of error. You want to know whether you're on the right path or not? Whether you're walking in the spirit of truth or in the spirit of error? Listen. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God. These people aren't walking the right path because they can't find the right path. Because love is not the road they want to take. Love is not the path they want to walk on. No, 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 I don't want to love those people over there. I don't want to love people from another country. I don't want to love people of a different color than me. I don't want to love people who have a different culture than me. I don't want to love the people who speak a language different than my own. Well, honey, if you don't, then I've got news for you. You will see hell, you will not see heaven because you are not walking on the straight and narrow. And straight is the way, and narrow is the gate. Excuse me, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Walking on the straight and narrow doesn't have a thing in the universe to do with baking cakes for gay couples who are getting married. You call that righteousness. That's not righteousness. It's stupidity. You bake cakes every day for people who are in their third, fourth, fifth, sixth, eighth marriage. Does the Bible condone divorce and remarriage? No, it does not. Do most Christians today condone divorce or marriage? Sure they do. But does the Bible? No, it does not. And I'll say it again. No, it does not. But they're picky about what they're going to stand for. They're picky about what they're... Oh, you bake cakes every day for uh, baby showers? Doesn't matter that mom is pregnant for her third kid and it's the third daddy. Doesn't matter she's not married. Doesn't matter she's bearing children out of wedlock. I'm not, listen, I'm not saying that to be condemnatory. Don't misunderstand me. I don't care if you've got ten kids from ten daddies. Sweetheart, we will love you in this church. And we'll love every one of those kids. And we will honor you. We will respect you. We will support you. We will affirm you, okay? So I'm not saying that to I'm talking from their standpoint. 
Okay, I'm talking about how they believe that bless God. Children should only be born within the confines of a marriage. Hallelujah, oh, glory to God. But that same bakery will bake cakes all day and all night for baby showers. Never once do they ask, is the mother married to the baby's daddy? Now, if they don't ask, you know what? They don't care. Doesn't matter to them. Why should it matter to you whose wedding you're making a cake for? Mm -hmm. If you could care less about whether you're baking a cake for somebody's third, fourth, fifth, tenth marriage, or if you're baking a cake for somebody who's having a baby who's never been married, but they're still having children. If, if you're able to do that, then why in the world are you so picky? I'll tell you why. Because you're a bigot, that's why. And a hypocrite. You choose who you wish to mystery. You choose those whom you wish to hold prejudice against. Mm -hmm. I can't wait till judgment day. Because you think you're going to escape the judgment of God. <laughs> oh, I love these people who are dumb enough to think. See, I fear God. I fear God. In my life, I fear God. There's a lot of times that I'll do or say something and I'll think afterwards, Lord, help me, Jesus. Lord, if, if I wouldn't write in that, then make me write because I sure enough don't want to have to answer for that in the judgment. You know what I'm saying? If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The only problem is you can't confess nothing you won't acknowledge. Right. It's going to be a whole lot of people stand before God in the judgment. You're going to have so many tractor trailer trucks full of sin behind you on judgment day. It isn't even funny because you never confessed any of it because you refuse to acknowledge any of it. You refuse to acknowledge your prejudice. You refuse to acknowledge your racism. You refuse to acknowledge your homophobia. You refuse to acknowledge your hatefulness. You refuse to acknowledge your maliciousness. You refuse to acknowledge your lovelessness. But I got news for you today. When I was living in Fort Worth, Texas, when I first went to Fort Worth and I became part of the Riverside Church of God. I've shared this over the years in my preaching. One of the things that thrilled me about being part of Riverside Church of God, I began to go around town and do business at different places, you know. And one of those places was a little place called John Winter's Florist. And I wanted to send flowers. Somebody had died or something and I wanted to send flowers for the funeral. And I went to the florist and we were talking and I told Mr. Winters that I was a, a member of Riverside Church of God. And this is the response that I heard over and 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 over again. Every time I mentioned to somebody that I was a member of Riverside Church of God, I hear this. Oh, that brother Gillum and sister Gillum, my God, they're the sweetest, most lovely people I've ever met in my life. You just feel the love of God just pouring out of them. It just comes out of their pores. You just feel that the love of God just emanates from them. And not only them, but that whole church. Everybody in that church that comes in here to do business, they just exude the love of God. They're the most loving, generous, compassionate people that I've ever met. John Winters was the first person to do that, but he was not the last. All of a sudden, as I begin to go around Fort Worth, and as I'm doing business at different places, I kept hearing those same exact words coming from every 
person that I met, everybody that I talked to, the entire church had a reputation. Well, I will tell you a little secret. A church can go no further. Brother uh, Elvis, the United Pentecostal pastor from Milford, Connecticut, many years ago I heard him preach this, and man, it has stuck to my ribs. He said a church can move no further forward than its pastor. He said, Pastor, if you're hateful, your church is going to be hateful. If you're judgmental, your church is going to be judgmental. If you're cruel, your church is going to be cruel. If you're critical, your church is going to be critical. Brother Ellis told the story, you know, the United Pentecostal Church is all about the high hair and the long sleeves and the long dresses and oh, hallelujah. Brother Ellis told the story. He said years ago I was sitting at the front of the church waiting for the service to begin and I was kind of praying sitting in my seat and I looked at the back of the sanctuary and in through the doors walked the mother of one of the children that we had been bringing to our Sunday school through the bus, they had a really big bus ministry and he said here come in the mother of one of the boys that we had been bringing to Sunday school and children's church with our bus ministry. She had never been in our church before. And he said, and here she come. And he said, and my God, don't you know, she was wearing hot pants and the tightest little blouse she could ever put on. He said, she wasn't keeping a lot of secrets. He said, I looked back and I saw her walk in. And he said, I saw the occasional glance of some of the members, you know, and my eyebrows going up in the air, and the eyes starting to roll a little, you know. And he said, so do you know what I did? He said, I got up off my seat, and I went to the back of the church, and I offered her my arm. And I walked her right down the center aisle of that church and set her down in the second pew from the front and let her know, honey, we're happy to have you with us today. He said, because my church will never go any further than I go. And I wanted them to know, I don't care what this lady's dressed like. I don't care that she come in here looking like, don't you dare look down on her. Don't you dare look judgmentally at her. This lady needs Jesus. I never forgot that. Little, uh, I just talked about it a little while ago. Used to come to church. Who? Tammy. Tammy. I was about to say Amy for some reason. Tammy. Tammy was simple minded. She, you know, uh, was born with certain defects and issues. She was not she was not entirely there as many people would judge her. I've got her on video on one of our church anniversaries getting up in front of the church and in her own little way saying first time I came to this church Brother Charles and Brother Tommy just loved me and they were so, remember that she said they were so loving and they just loved me and she started to cry while she was telling this she went to First Baptist in Dallas but our service was in the afternoon and their service was in the morning guess what that girl came every week, every single week she came from First Baptist directly to our church so she could be with us in service. I baptized. I baptized her in Jesus' name. I was one of two preachers who preached her funeral. 
at First Baptist Church. You know what church that is, don't you? That's the one where one of Trump's biggest supporters pastors. You know why? Because I've been preaching for 40 something years. And if there's anything you ever want to know about this church, you better know this now. I preach, teach, believe, and practice love. Mm -hmm. I don't care what somebody walks into this church wearing. I don't care what their life experience. I don't care what their situation. I've said it before. I'll say it again. If a man walks through that door wearing a dress and he's got hairy legs and high heels and paints his face with lipstick and eyeshadow, I'm going to hug their neck and welcome them. Some people say, yeah, those kind of people, they're just sick in the head. Well, if, 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 if you're right, then how much more should we love them? Mm -hmm. If you're right. See, they use that to justify their hatred. They use that to justify their malice. But my friend, according to John, what identifies the child of God is love. You want to know whether you're on a straight and narrow? Is your life instructed by love? Is all you do motivated by love? I'm not bragging today. But the pastor has to set an example for the people. Tommy and I in the church folks on Sunday after church we used to go to a Denny's in Dallas by the church. After church every Sunday we'd go to Denny's we'd have a meal, we'd have a good time laugh and goof up. See when I'm in the pulpit I'm serious as a heart attack. But once I get out of the pulpit folks if you get to know me you'll find out that I'm actually very jovial, I like to be lighthearted, I like to laugh, you know. Uh, but in the pulpit, I don't play games. But when I'm out of the pulpit, I, I enjoy having a good time, you know. And little Tammy used to go with us every week, get her hamburger. I don't want no cheese, I don't want no mayo, I don't want no mustard, I don't want no cat, I want the bread and I want the meat, that's it. And boy, don't bring her anything different or there's going to be hell to pay. <laughs> well, most Sundays when we go, there was a homeless man who was quite a, he was bigger than I am as far as weight. Of course, I've lost a little bit of weight now, but he was a pretty big man. And one winter night, we went after church to the Denny's and I saw him sitting there. He'd often be sitting there and he might have a cup of coffee that, for all I know, that's all he did before. I offered to buy him on many, many, many occasions a meal, but if he had already eaten, he would tell me, and, you know, and I wouldn't have to. But honey, I'm not going to let anybody go hungry on my lunch. I'll, I'll go into debt feeding people. I really will, because I hate the idea of hunger. There is nothing in this world more horrific and more haunting than hunger. How do I know I've been there? It is, it is something you don't ever want to experience. Not having any food and not having any way to get any. I've been there and I'm going to tell you, it was one of the hardest things I've ever been through in my life. And I will never let anybody go hungry on my watch, ever. So this particular day, I noticed it was freezing outside. I mean, it was cold. And I looked in and sat there, and I always would greet him, you know, because I got to where I knew him, and I talked to him. And I asked him, I said, where's your coat? And he said, I don't have one. I said, what do you mean you don't have one? He said, somebody stole it. Here's the man sitting there and freeze, I mean freezing to like 20 degree temperatures. He doesn't even have a coat. I said to Tommy, we lived only about five blocks away from the Denny's. I said, uh, I need to run by the house. You know that hunting jacket that I've got? 
It's a beautiful camouflage hunting jacket. It's all it's lined and uh, insulated, you know. Well, I bought it at a thrift shop, but it was like brand new, beautiful jacket. And it had a hood and everything, you know. And that jacket, I used to tell Tommy, was my favorite jacket in the whole world because it, it, that thing kept you warm like you wouldn't believe. But it was funny because when I bought it, it was actually about a size or two too big for me. But since it was a thrift shop, you know, I only paid like 20 bucks for it. So I went ahead and bought it anyway, even though it was too big for me. And, but boy, um, I used to go to our property in Oklahoma and that's what I would wear in the winter months because that coat kept you so warm. My God, I never, ever had a coat that kept me so warm. And I told Tommy, I said, you know that hunting jacket I've got? That'll fit him perfect because he's bigger than I am. And here that jacket is a couple sizes too big, so it'll fit him perfect. I said, I need to go get that coat and bring it back and give it to him. And that's what I did. And I had people say, well, Pastor, why in the world would you give away your favorite coat? Because it was my favorite coat. And the answer is simple. Because I walked the straight and narrow. Because everything, and I pray to God till the day I die, it always stays this way. Everything I do is informed by love. Love is the agency whereby compassion is born. Without love, there can be no compassion. Let me tell you something, Pentecostal churches. Without compassion, there can be no miracles. Read in your Bible how many times Jesus performed miracles having first been moved by compassion. In Matthew 9.30 6. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And what did he do next? He fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes. That miracle was born of compassion. In Matthew 14, 14, and Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. Listen to the next phrase. And he healed their sick. <laughs> Those healings were born of compassion. Matthew 18, 27, then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. This was the Lord offering a parable about God forgiving us our sins when we first come to him. Why does God do it? Out of compassion. I'm going to tell you something. I've been in the Pentecostal church my entire life. I have never seen a time in the history of this movement, at least in my 59 years, when there have been fewer miracles, fewer healings, fewer deliverances that occur within Pentecostal spirit-filled churches than I see happening today. And do you know why? It's very simple, folks. Because there is no compassion in the church anymore. Oh, but our sister Smith was healed. Well, of course, sister Smith was healed. You have compassion on your own. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Mm, yes. Oh, let that young man come in who's been diagnosed with AIDS, with HIV. Are you compassionate for him? No! You say, well, he brought it on himself. 
Let that person come in who smoked for 40 years and they've been diagnosed with lung cancer. What do you say? Well, what do you say? You see, the church has lost its compassion. When I was a child, let me tell you something. When I was a kid, our churches used to preach love. Our churches used to preach compassion. Our churches used to preach mercy. Our churches used to preach charity. You don't hear that anymore. No, Kenneth Copeland is too busy preaching about how God can make you rich. Why should he preach about how you're obligated to feed the poor? My Lord, am I telling the truth today? If you're looking at this church today and thinking, I'm considering maybe going there, I'm thinking about visiting. Well, let me fill you in, folks. You come to this church and you hang around long enough, I guarantee you, you will see the most loving, united body of people you've ever seen. I've been doing affirming ministry for 40 years now, uh, 30 years now plus. And I'm here to tell you, everybody that ever came into our church, I tell people all the time, if you come into this church and you don't feel welcome, it don't have nothing to do with us. I guarantee you that. I guarantee you that. I've had people come into our church, brother. We had folks come in that I, that I imagine identified as transgender, but somehow, some way, they were kind of in the middle of the mix. They hadn't quite fully gone one way and I hadn't quite fully gone another way. You know what? We love them. We've had people come in who identify as transgender who, who did live the gender that they, you know, uh, perceived themselves with. But they were still a little rough on the eyes. They were still a little difficult. You know what we did? We loved them. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to tell you something. Somebody can come in this church, and I'm not, y'all understand what I'm saying. I don't want anybody getting mad at me. They can come in here and be a raging queen. They can be one of them real flamboyant, you know, wearing the tutu and carrying a purse queen. I'm going to love you. I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with nobody, no kind of way. I'm not one of them. You know, like in the personal ads, no things. <laughs> you know. No, let me tell you something. The love of God transcends every conceivable division, every conceivable uh, uh, obstacle. The love of God transcends all those things. So when somebody comes in, we've had people, like I said, we've had, and we've had a number, Tommy can tell you, we've had a number of people come in who were very seriously psychologically or mentally impaired. I'm trying to word it the best way I can. And they had mental health issues, or they had, you know, a condition, and they were slow, if I may use that phrase, okay? You know what we did? We loved them. We had some of those people right down me in our church for years and years and years. Yep. I had some people quit coming to our church because they didn't like those people. They come to me and talk to me about. It. Well, that person drives me crazy because they sound like an idiot and they talk like this and they do that and they say dumb things and blah, blah, blah. And I look at them and I say, "Well, we're an affirming church. We welcome everybody and we're going to live and we're going to walk on the straight and narrow. We love everybody. Mm -hmm. So if you can't love them, you might want to find you another church. Got news for you: No matter what church you go to, you're going to find people like that there." Mm -hmm. I've been part of a lot of churches in my life. A lot of churches. I've been a member of a number of different churches over the years. And you know what? Without fail, you're going to find people like that in every... There's going to be somebody in every congregation 
that drives you nuts. Somebody in every congregation you don't necessarily enjoy. Somebody you don't necessarily care to be around. But you see, the congregation of the saints, listen to me, children. This is the practice ground where we learn to love people in spite of. And then, if we learn that here, we can carry it out there. So if you go to church, and you can't even go to a church because there's somebody there that you can't stand and you don't like. And instead of praying and asking God to help you love them like He wants you to love them, you decide you need to go somewhere else because you can't stand to be around them. Guess what? You just failed the test. You just failed the test. You're no longer on the straight and narrow. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Do you hear what I'm telling you? You're no longer. Well, what do I do when I come up to somebody who's got mental health issues? What do I do when I come up to somebody who's mentally retarded? And I know people today don't like that phrase, but I can't think of another phrase to use off the top of my head. What do I do when I come up to somebody that has these issues? You know, the same thing you do with somebody that doesn't have those issues. You love them. Why? Because straight is the way. Right. You don't change. You don't go to the left or the right. You keep going right. straight. And when you come to the next one, you love them. And when you come to the next one, you love them. And when you come to the next one, you love them. And when you come to the next one, you love them. Because this is the nature of the straight and narrow way. It's all about loving people. And Jesus met Mark 6.34 when he came out saw much people and was moved with compassion for them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach many things. Had Peter and John not experienced compassion for the man at the gate of the temple, they would have passed him by without speaking a word. But instead, they stopped and offered him what they could, which in this instance was the power of God. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, Acts 3, 1 through 8. And a certain layman, man laid from his mother's womb, was carried whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. How many of us today are walking the straight and narrow? How many of us today have found the path? It's not that the path is hard to follow. No, it's not. It's hard to find. Mm -hmm. It's not hard to follow. Once you find it, I'm going to tell you, once you get on this path, loving people ain't hard. My mother said, after she had been in our church in Dallas for a number of years, my mother said to me some years back, she said, you know what I love about this church? She said, I love the fact that, it, that you teach and you preach and you practice. Just love people. That's it. Just love people. She said, I love that. She said, I didn't grow up in the church like that. I, that's not the way, you know, people in the church I grew up in used to look at people funny because they weren't dressed just right. Or the hair wasn't cut just right, you know. She said, but 
But this church is all about just love. She said, my God, it literally makes things so much easier. Not being judgmental, not being critical, not finding fault. It is so much easier when you understand that the only obligation you have to anyone is to love them. And when you get on that path, It is the purpose, it is the plan, it is the vision of this ministry to build a church whose foundation is love. Lastly today, Matthew 22, just got to share this. 22, 36 through 40, Master, a man asked Jesus, which is the great commandment in the law? Meaning, which is the premier, the first, the most important commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. But then the Lord couldn't let it hang there. He then added something. He said, the second is like unto it. He said, the second commandment is in the same identical name. He said, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. See, you can't love God and not love your neighbor and think you're on the straight and narrow. Uh-uh. Those who are on the straight and narrow are doing both. They're loving God, and because they love God, they're able to love their neighbor. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? He said, on these two commandments hang all the law mm -hmm. and the prophets. Mm -hmm. See, if you look at the entirety of the law, it all boils down to trying to help you love God and help you love your neighbor. That's why you don't steal. That's why you don't kill. That's why you don't commit adultery. That's why you don't bear false witness. That's why you don't lie. You hear what I'm telling you? Why? Because you learn to love your neighbor. That's right. Oh, children, my question today is, can you find it? Can you find the path? Because I've got news for you today. The straight and narrow is not a path that's hard to follow. Maybe hard to find because it works against human nature. But our nature is what ought to be changed yes. when we become a child of God, yes. when we become born again. Yes. Our yes. thinking, the yes. way we view things, the way we look at things ought to change. Yes. Let's say